So my name is Samantha Bonwick, and I'm the outreach coordinator at the Pincher Creek Municipal and District Library. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Lisa, Lisa Wilkinson. She is our third speaker of our 2021 Winter Speaker Series. Lisa Wilkinson is a senior speaker is a senior species at risk biologist and provincial bat coordinator with Alberta Environment and Parks. Lisa has worked with a variety of species and currently most of her work pertains to bats, including monitoring, management and outreach. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Lisa. Hey, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And I've, just before I switch to my presentation, I'm gonna show you this. Uh, so just for size, this is a, a little brown bat. It's a good specimen. So you can see this little hand. It's just, if you haven't seen a bat close up, this will give you an idea of the actual size of them. And uh, with that, I will launch into the presentation. Hopefully this continues to work. Right, so I'm going to assume everything is working and everyone can hear me unless I <laughs> hear otherwise. Um, <coughs> excuse me, so I'm going to talk about bats in general with more of a focus on Alberta bats. I, I find it's always good to start by dispelling the common myths, <clears throat> excuse me, about, mat, about bats, because they're shrouded in mystery and misunderstood. And I'm guessing a lot of, most of you probably are more well-informed than a lot of other people because you're here on the talk. But um, one of the things is, do all bats carry rabies? And that's not true. Bats can carry rabies, they're mammals. Um, but in Alberta, less than half of 1% carry rabies. So it's not something you need to be afraid of, it's just to be aware of it. And I always like to remind people that you don't pick up a bat with bare hands like you wouldn't pick up any other wild animal with bare hands because they might bite in self-defense. So just to keep that in, in mind, but we don't have to be afraid of bats and having bats around us um, isn't a health risk. And do bats get caught in your hair? The answer is no. Um, it wasn't until I started studying bats that I heard this and so many people have asked me this question or told me they had some relative who had a bat caught in their hair, but um, you know, bats really have a very good uh, maneuverability and awareness of where we are. And I'll talk about that. So they really know where we are and they don't wanna land on us. And if they did, they wouldn't get caught in their hair. But, and bats are blind. This is one thing most people think some bats are blind and it's not true, all bats can see. And I'll talk a little bit about that so all bats can see. So those are the biggest myths out of the way. So let's talk about Alberta. So in the province of Alberta, we know we have at least nine species. We may have a couple more that we haven't confirmed in Alberta, but have been found on the borders of BC and Montana. Within Canada, there are 18 species, but throughout the world, there's over 1300 species. Um, I'm going to briefly talk about some of the other kinds of bats in the world. Mostly I'll talk about our, our Alberta bats, which are all insectivorous bats. And so, yeah, just for a little bit of our world tour, um, bats, there's a huge variety and the weird and wonderful, um, the cute and strange. So just a really quick sampling of some of the bats from around the world. And again, I'm talking about variety and there's size is one of the biggest things. The smallest bat, the little bumblebee bat, which is found in Thailand. And you can see that's an adult bat. It's in somebody's hand. They only weigh about two grams versus the large flying fox. And I'm guessing many people have heard about this kind of uh, fruit eating bat. So their wingspan can be five and a half feet. So if you think about as a person, your arm span or your wingspan, is about the same as your height. So I'm 5'3", so my arm span is almost as long as a, a large flying fox. But they are very light. 
they're flyers. They don't have hollow bones like birds, but they're very light. Now the family, um, so bats aren't rodents. Um, they are, they belong to the group Chiroptera, the order Chiroptera, which means hand wing. And so if you look at this closely, you can see that there's the elbow that's bent and there's a little thumb and there's four fingers. So they have the same bones as we do. Um, it's just been modified to, have, modified to have elongated fingers with this very thin, thin membrane that allows them to fly. And interestingly, I mean, the, the flipper in a, a whale, for example, a small flipper has the same bones because we're all mammals, same bones. They're just different in terms of their structure. So um, these uh, mammals are, they're the only ones that can truly fly. There are gliding squirrels, but no other mammals can truly fly. Now, whenever I talk to people, especially kids, <laughs> about bats, I like to relate them to Batman because everyone knows Batman's a superhero. So what I attempt to do is to convince you that bats are superheroes in their own right as well. And one of the other things I wanted to start with is comparing them to some of the mammals that you might know about. So of course I said they're mammals, they have fur, they um, produce milk. So you might think about bats as being like rodents, like mice, because they're very small, but there's a lot of differences. So if you take a mouse, for example, it has one or two litters a year. It might have eight or more little, little young. Um, bats only have one pup, we call them pups, typically per year. So that means that it takes them a really long time for populations to recover if they can only have one young per year. Sometimes it's two, but up here it's mostly one. The other thing that's kind of unique about them is they can live a very long time. The, the record for insect eating bats, the insectivorous, bat, insectivorous bats, and that's what we have in all of Canada, just insect eating bats, um, is 42 years. And the really interesting thing is one of the longest records of 39 years is from here in Alberta. So I live in Edson and Cadman Cave, which is just south of Hinton, is a hibernation site. And back in the 70s, some scientists had put some little bands on the bats and other researchers were going in to monitor the bats. And so they know this one particular bat lived to be at least 39. So we have, as far as I know, the second highest recorded lifespan of a wild bat in the world from Alberta. So that's kind of cool. So anyway, they live a long time, but even one pup per season, most probably don't live quite that long. Maybe they produce 20 in their lifetime. So that's a real issue if a population declines. And if you're wondering why I've got a picture of a grizzly bear, bats do have a similarity to grizzly bears because many of our bats hibernate, so they need to eat a lot in the fall. So just like grizzly bears are going out and eating berries and stuffing themselves, bats are stuffing themselves before the fall. So in some ways they have more in common with a grizzly bear than a mouse. And you can obviously see that little um, bat pup in the picture. And with our little bat pups, it, within about, they're born, they are born blind. I said they aren't blind, but their eyes are closed when they're born. Um, they don't have fur. And some of them are flying within three to four weeks. So they have a really steep growth curve. And I'm guessing most people know that the bats we have here, the insect eating bats use echolocation. It's highly sophisticated. They make calls um, at a frequency that we can't hear. Um, occasionally dogs can hear the ones at lower frequencies and they just make an echo that bounces back off their surroundings. And it's so sophisticated, they can catch things the size of a mosquito, which is really bad. It still baffles me that they can, they can do that. So it's so sophisticated um, and that's how they see the world. And I'll just point out again, you can see that they do have eyes. So in just if it's low light, it's dusk and they're just flying and they're not trying to catch bugs, they can use their eyesight. So what I wanted to do is play you a bat call. So one of the tools that bat biologists use is called a bat detector. And it will um, record the calls of bats and it can play that amplifies them so we can hear them. And the cool thing about this technology that's advanced over the years is it also shows it on a graph. And because of that, we can sometimes tell which species of bat is calling, not always, but sometimes. 
And so I'll just play that for you. So the higher, so the bigger bats we have, like the big brown bat, will echolocate at a lower frequency, 20, 25 kilohertz. The little guys are all in the 40 kilohertz range. Um, so if we could hear them, we would hear this, it's just a clicking. And the closer they get to their, um, their insect prey, the faster it is because the echoes come together. So um, there's a lot we've learned about this echolocation and using acoustics to, to understand bats. And obviously it's a really useful tool because we can't see them that easily. Um, and there's still lots we need to learn about our bats. And so I mentioned superheroes. So this is number one, they eat insect pests. Um, now this is an example throughout North America of what they eat. Under the forestry side, pretty much all those are found in Alberta. So they're very useful. Um, for agriculture, they've got a lot of benefits, especially in the southeastern U.S. Um, they've, it's been estimated that they save farmers billions of dollars because they're a natural pesticide. So things like that, that uh, caterpillar up there in the corn. So they are natural pesticides, so they have a huge service. And of course, I'm sure everybody's heard that bats do eat mosquitoes. Um, and so how many mosquito sized insects can a little brown bat eat in a single night? It's a lot, um, up to their own body mass. And a female bat, if it's lactating, yeah, definitely it could eat its body mass a night. So um, if you get you know, huge colonies, there, there's a place in Texas where I've actually been, and there's a cave that has 20 million bats. And uh, so they eat tons of insects in a night pretty impressive. So that's one of the superhero things. And just finally, before we look at some other bats from around the world, just a, a fun reminder that these bats obviously rely on sound. So they tend to have pretty big ears relative to their bodies. Um, both these species are found in BC. The littler guy is the Townsend's big-eared bat. And the guy with the really big ears is the spotted bat. And uh, but just to bear that in mind, so they can see, you can see their eyes, but hearing is really the way these insect eating bats navigate the world. And just to take a, a deeper dive into the bats of Alberta, I mentioned we had nine species that we know for sure. And I tend to break them down into their habits because obviously bats can't be active during winter because there aren't any insects. So we have three species that are migratory. They actually migrate a little way south. Um, so we've got the red bat, the hoary bat, and the silver-haired bat. And these are our most colorful bats, actually. Um, and these guys, in the summers, they tend to just roost in the foliage of trees. Sometimes silver hairs roost in cavities. So they do have some very differences in the summer as well as the winter, but they're migratory. Um, and then we have our other bats and they all look kind of like just brown bats. <laughs> so on the left of your screen is the big brown bat, on the right is the little brown bat, and the little brown bat is the one I held up at the beginning. Um, the big brown bat's slightly bigger. And the other four species are also brown <laughs> and the differences are fairly subtle. Um, the one in the bottom corner has larger ears and there's a few differences and as, as bat biologists too, we often have to take very specific measurements to identify some of these species that can be quite similar to one another. Um, so I know people often say, oh, I saw a little brown bat. And well, I don't know for sure <laughs> if it was a little brown bat because um, they do all look very similar. The one characteristic all these, the brown bats have is they hibernate. So they still may travel quite a distance to hibernate. It could be two, 300 kilometers to get to a place to hibernate. Um, and, uh, and they tend to roost in the summer in cavities, places like that. So I'll talk a little bit about that. 
So these guys, trees are really important to them, big old trees. Uh, biologists refer to big old trees as wildlife trees because they have cracks and crevices where animals can roost or nest, so and woodpecker holes, etc. So especially aspen trees are really desirable for um, female bats who want to raise their pups. The coolies are a site where there are a lot of bats in there. And of course there are buildings. And if people have questions at the end about bats and buildings, we can talk about that. Typically it is the little brown bat and the big brown bat that have adapted to um, being in these urban environments. So summer habitat is particularly, particularly important for the female bats because they have their, their pups and they often get into groups. So they need somewhere that's warm and safe. And we call those maternity colonies. Um, in Alberta, you know, a maternity colony could be a few bats, it could be several hundred. As I mentioned, in the much warmer parts of North America, there are just more bats in general, and that colony could be thousands and occasionally in the millions. In this case, um, the female bats still have to go out and catch their insects. They usually leave their pups behind in a colony. Sometimes another adult will stay behind. And so the females go and feed, they come back, they nurse their young and they go off again. They can fly with them when the, the pups are young, but typically it's, they leave them behind. So that's one of the things that's really important is a nice, warm, safe place. And they do like it warm. These female bats like it very warm for their pups. So that's summer habitat, winter habitat. Now, when you think hibernators, I know everyone immediately thinks caves. And this is a picture of Cadaman Cave that I was talking about. But we only know about eight caves in Alberta that are hibernacula, places where bats hibernate. In most of the Northwest Canada and the US, we think there aren't, because there aren't lots of caves, bats are probably roosting in small cracks and crevices in rocks. So we don't know where a lot of these are. Um, this is obviously really important because when bats are hibernating, if they get disturbed, they're, they wake up and they use some of the fat they've stored to make it through to spring. So for quite a number of years now in Alberta, under the Wildlife Act, if it's a cave that has, we know it's a hibernacula, um, people aren't allowed to enter during the winter, basically September through to May, because if too many people come in and disrupt them, they just keep waking up and using all that fat and they won't be able to make it to spring because there's no other food. Um, Cadaman Cave is uh, an example and it's just as researchers, a small group go in typically annually <clears throat> just to check on the bats and count them, but that's a uh, minimal disturbance. So summer habitats and winter habitats are very specific and they're also very important. And one thing too about Alberta, especially our, you know, our Northern Alberta bats, they could be in hibernation for six months or more. It's a long time. So think back to that grizzly bear analogy that they need to eat a lot <laughs> before they go into hibernation. So let's leave the, the cold Alberta North for now and talk a little bit about bats of the world. Because other parts of the world are much warmer, uh, it supports more wildlife diversity and more species of bats. So I already talked about fruit bats. And one of the things that you're probably noticing about fruit bats is they have really big eyes. Their ears are smaller relative to their bodies. Um, fruit bats don't echolocate. They have a great sense of smell, a great sense of sight. They're not chasing little tiny objects in the dark. They're going for fruit, they can smell it. They can use their large eyes like owls do to navigate in the dark. So these fruit bats do not generally echolocate. And they're often known as flying foxes because they do have that little fox or dog-like face and they can be smaller or larger. As I mentioned before, the biggest bats in the world are fruit bats, the flying fox. So they're, yeah, they're pretty appealing looking bats. Now, going back to the, what they do that's super useful is because they eat fruit, they drop seeds. So it's been known for quite a while that, especially in um, South America, where there's been a lot of rainforest deforestation, they found out that bats by 
eating and dropping these seeds are contributing greatly to these forests regrowing. And much more recently, in the last couple of years, there was a study in Africa that found this colony of straw colored fruit bats, how many seeds they could disseminate in a single night. These are large colonies, so they're able to help kickstart the growth of hundreds of acres of forest. So bats are really, really important. Another interesting thing about bats is they are also pollinators. So um, when I talk to kids about I use I ask what animals are normally going around and eating nectar and and might have your hummingbird or your bee, but um, these bats are specifically um, designed, you can see the bat in the corner with a long tongue, for going in there and getting the nectar. And in doing so, they get covered in pollen and then they go from flower to flower. So they're really important pollinators. There are some flowers that only open at night um, for bats and the large, uh, some of the large cacti that are down in Arizona are pollinated by bats. And there are over 300 species of food producing plants that rely on bats as pollinators. So we have products in our grocery stores that um, bats have helped to grow essentially. So another important thing that bats do. Now, the other kind of bats you find around the world, um, there are bats that eat other small animals, could be small bats, could be frogs, even small mice. Um, these bats use sound, obviously, they, they have very good sense of sound. There's one kind that's called the fishing bat, which can actually detect fish near the surface of the water with the ripples, and they do have big feet. So if you think about if you see an osprey scooping fish out of the water, it's kind of the bat equivalent of that. So they're specialized to eat fish. Um, the little guy here you can see on the ice cube tray is a vampire bat. There are three species of vampire bats found in Central and South America. Um, they typically don't bother people and they don't you know, bite you in the neck and turn you into vampires. Um, they could, and you can see they're pretty small because that is an, an ice cube tray. I think this must come from a, a zoo or some other facility. Um, they do eat blood. They typically feed on uh, farm animals like cows, chickens. They have really sharp teeth. They make a tiny incision. They slurp up the blood and they're, they're gone pretty quickly. And these bats actually can crawl a bit. Um, and they some specialize on birds and others on the mammals. And as long as there's not a lot of them, it's not a problem. So, and they're very interesting because they, um, they're one of the species that will take some food and go back to their cave or wherever they're roosting and they may share it with other bats and their colony family members. So they're misunderstood, <laughs> but there are vampire bats, but again, we don't need to worry about them too much. So that's kind of the bats are superhero summary, insect pest control, pollinators, reforestation. But there is a, there are challenges facing bats. Um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about this. A number of threats um, down the bottom of pesticides, not a huge one here, but obviously bats eat insects. And so <laughs> pesticides do affect their insect prey. Habitat loss, like most species that end up being threatened or endangered, it's associated with habitat loss. Uh, I'd mentioned that some of these bats like to roost in big old trees. So in forestry, that's often some of the trees that are cut down and um, there are forestry plans that try to maintain some of those big old trees or maybe mature trees that will then grow into big old trees. So the bats have habitat like that. Bats need to drink, so wetlands are important. And the vegetation around wetlands is often really, um, really good for insects as well. So, you know, there's some bats are more resilient than others, but overall habitat loss is an issue. And the two biggest ones, uh, wind farms is one, and this one is specific pretty much to our migratory species. And those of you in the South know there's lots of wind farms, it's very windy there. And we learned once we started putting up wind farms that uh, 
our migratory bats in the fall are seem to be going along these really windy areas and unfortunately they are colliding with the wind turbines and so those three species of bats that migrate migrate are being pretty heavily impacted by wind farms and so there's a lot of research going on how to deter them and how to mitigate for that um, the, what I was going to talk more about is white nose syndrome I find that most people are um, interested in asking about white nose syndrome and that one affects hibernators so both kinds of bats their wintering lifestyle each one has a different risk so white nose syndrome most people have heard of it it was first detected in the winter of 06 07 in the state of new york and it's called white nose syndrome because of this fungus that often grows on their nose this fungus only grows in caves so it's a we call a cold loving fungus so it only affects bats that hibernate in caves and it has killed millions of bats throughout North America. Um, this map hasn't been updated with 2020 data, but you can see the blue and the greens are where it first started in New York and it's been spreading. And you can see now that it's been found in Manitoba, it's been found in the state of Washington, and uh, Montana recently found the fungus. They haven't, so the fungus gets into the cave and onto the bats. And when the bats manifest symptoms of having this fungus, which is they're irritated, basically. So they wake up from hibernation. And as we've talked about, there's no food. So they, they die. Um, and research would actually find piles of dead bats in caves because they're, they're basically just waking up and there's no food for them to eat. Um, so some states too are also, and provinces are looking to see if there's signs of the fungus. Um, Montana has found the fungus in some uh, soil sediment. They have not yet found it as white nose syndrome in bats, but obviously it's pretty close to Alberta. And Alberta and OBC, um, we're all trying to be a lot more vigilant. And one of the things I've talked about is making sure, um, so those caves I talked about, they're closed in the winter. And if we know of other, the caves during the summer, cavers are supposed to follow some pretty strict decontamination protocols for their gear because that's the, the supposition that this fungus was brought to North America from Europe on clothing or gear from someone who'd been in a cave because this fungus does exist in Europe but the bats there aren't dying from white nose syndrome so it sounds like they evolved so the bats aren't susceptible to it but for our bats in North America it was new um, and it's really taken its toll as that millions millions of bats have died there's a little bit of hope that in some of those first caves now that we're up to 15 years or so um, there's been some positive signs that the bats might be starting to develop a bit of tolerance or resistance to it but um, as i mentioned it's still because bats have such a slow reproductive cycle with one puppy a year, it takes a really long time for a population to recover. And um, there are species in the Southern US that are actually endangered species. So you can imagine that um, having in a cave that gets this fungus, you could have 90% of bats dying, 98% of bats dying. Um, so it's pretty serious. So in Alberta, we wanna be careful to try to make sure it doesn't arrive here on someone's gear or equipment accidentally. Um, it's gonna get here naturally. We'll get here. So what are we doing? Um, we're doing a lot of monitoring. For one thing, I talked about acoustic detectors. There's a whole North American program to monitor bats so that we can learn as much about them now as and it also helps us to understand when white nose does get here, what the impact is on our bats. Um, so monitoring is really important. I talked about hibernation sites, so we would like to locate them so we can make sure um, people don't go in with contaminated gear so they can be identified. Um, and we do have special kinds of detectors that can be put in caves that will hopefully detect when the bats come in in the fall and leave in the spring. As I mentioned, um, we just don't know of that many, and there's probably a lot of small cracks and crevices where the bats are. 
So fortunately, there's some cavers that are really helpful and we try to work with the caving community because they're the ones that might find bats hibernating. So we've got some really good working relationships with cavers um, to try to identify these caves and small, very small groups of biologists will go in and monitor the known hibernacula from time to time. Um, I talked about the maternity roots, those important places where the females have their pups. So the more of those we find, again, maybe we can protect them. The ones we mostly find are in buildings, which makes sense because that's, people find them. The ones that are in trees, in fact, the ones that use trees move around every few days. Um, so the maternity colonies that we're learning the most about are in buildings. And they're really important. And there is a, a citizen science project to report those maternity roosts. Um, protecting habitat, as I said, or, or creating new habitat. So the big old trees, the wetlands, that vegetation, all that stuff benefits bats. Um, here in Alberta, we've been supporting research. There's been some research that's uh, focused more in BC, but they've been looking at, um, let me step, take a step back. There's a lot of research going on as to can we kill the fungus? Can you vaccinate back bats against it? Can you cure them once they have it? Looking at um, bacteria, fungi, all sorts of things. It turns out bats do have natural bacteria growing on their wings and some of them will help to combat the fungus. And so the study that's been based out of BC, although some of this, the research was done here in Alberta, is to make what they like to call a probiotic cocktail of bacteria. So taking the naturally growing bacteria and amplifying it and then being able to apply it to bat wings in the hopes that it sort of impregnate, impregnates them against the fungus getting on them. And so they are doing trials right now in BC for that. So for example, those maternity roots could be really important because maybe this <clears throat> probiotic, uh, uh, bacteria could be put on the um, places in maternity roosts where bats go in and out. And in doing so, they would rub their uh, wings and get this bacteria on, and it might help prevent them from getting the fungus when they then go into the cave. And one thing I should mention is, so if bats do survive the winter, if they've got the fungus and maybe it wasn't too severe, um, they will lose all signs of it within weeks of leaving the hibernation site because this fungus does not thrive in warm temperatures. But unfortunately, um, the fungus is still there in the cave, so the bat may lose it and have the summer and be fine, but in the winter, it goes back to hibernate and it gets exposed again. So um, this is one of the, the lessons we're learning in these. Some species seem to be developing a little bit of resistance, but it takes a very long time. And yeah, we're trying to delay the arrival of the fungus into Alberta. I've talked about that. We even have a campaign that's uh, starting to go in parks just to remind people who have RVs and motorhomes to check your awnings and things like that so you don't actually accidentally transport a bat. I really want to highlight the Alberta Community Bat Program. So this is a, a nonprofit organization that started about five years ago, five or six years ago. And um, it's a great website. Just remember Alberta Bats. It's got all sorts of resources. And it's, I'm showing you right now the three guides that are probably the most commonly used. So to deal with bats in buildings, how about building bat houses and actually building bat friendly communities or just making your yard or your farm or your property more bat friendly. So it's a really excellent resource. And that through this organization, that citizen science project I was talking about um, with monitoring maternity roosts. So people, if you go to that website um, and if you have a, a bat roost that's on building on your property and um, you know, if you have problems with it, there's help and information. And if you're happy with it and you wanna monitor and report it, that's great. Um, <clears throat> in order to figure out what kind of species it is, if uh, you collect poop or guano, it gets sent away for DNA analysis to tell us what the species is. And um, I do have people mailing bat guano to me every year and we send it off to a lab and have it tested. So 
it's really fantastic. And a lot of people are quite uh, protective of their, their bat colonies. Um, the one thing is we don't have a lot of information from the less populated parts of the province. So we'd like to learn about that as well. And again, you know, if there is a decline, it would be noticed at a maternity colony. You know, if there was a colony where there was always 100 bats or 50 bats, and then one year there's five, um, then we know something's been going on at the hibernation site, and it could be an indication that white nose syndrome has arrived. So citizen science, yes, it, people um, really play a large role in helping us learn about bats and protect bat habitat. And, and of course, part of that problem, I, mean, I talked at the beginning about there is so much misunderstanding between bats and people that it's really essential that we do a lot of outreach to talk to people about bats so they're not afraid of them and that we can provide solutions if there are problems. Sometimes you just can't live with bats and you certainly don't want bats in your living area. Um, quite often, it, you can reach an agreement, but uh, so this organization, um, Alberta Environment Parks is a partner with it, can provide a lot of guidance and lead some citizen science. So finally, I'm gonna wrap it up and then you can ask questions. So to help bats, I've talked about some of this, you know, just don't disturb bats, especially during hibernation. Um, maybe build a bat house if it's needed, plant trees, forests, corridors, vegetation, all that kind of stuff. You can avoid using pesticides. And one of the most important things is just spreading the word that bats are useful. Um, so to dispel those myths and uh, remind people that bats are very useful all around the world. And here in Alberta, they eat insect pests. So they are a valued component of the ecosystem. And with that, so I've got one final slide here. This is um, that cave I mentioned in Texas that has 20 million bats. This is, um, I didn't take this picture, but I have actually been there and seen the bats leaving. And I was there for at least an hour and the bats were just still screaming out, just bats. And uh, as I mentioned, the farmers really welcome them. And there was actually a time when they used to actually collect the bat guano to use as fertilizer. They don't anymore. Some places in the tropics, they do use bat guano as fertilizer. Thank you, Lisa. That was very informative. I love hearing about bats. I think they're so cute. <laughs> so we are going to start with our questions. The first two are just like cool little comments from John Saremba from Burke Mountain Naturalist from Burke Mountain Nat Naturalist. Right, we, yeah. we met John at the beginning. <laughs> yes, yes. We find that the little brown myotis and Yuma myotis bats forage over water flying very low compared to the other species. Mm -hmm. So that's his first comment. Yep. And yes, yeah, some species of bats do spend, as John pointed out, more time foraging over water. And as I mentioned, bats drink water and they do drink it on the wing. So they just go down really low and they'll just take a drink while they're flying and keep going. And in some places where there aren't a lot of water bodies, even puddles, bats will use the puddles to drink out of, just flying over them. Crazy. Cool. So they're on the go, drinkers. Yes, they are. <laughs> Okay, and then from the same person, um, he just wanted to point out that it was an excellent point about WNS research being conducted by Dr. Corey Lawson. Turns out that fat bats are healthier than skinny, skinny bats. We also collect bat guano for, for the first month after emergence to test for fungus as early warning systems. Those are excellent points. Thanks for bringing those up, John. Yeah, so um, so I said that the fungus, when it gets into the cave and onto the bats, if there's enough of a fungal load, it will irritate the bats so they wake up. Um, and then they start using up that stored fat. So essentially the 
fatter a bat is, the more stored fat it has. So it has a greater chance of surviving the winter. So in very general terms, fatter bats will survive better <laughs> than the thinner bats. Um, and the other thing that uh, John mentioned is something we're going to start doing in Alberta, which is if you can collect that bat guano, that bat poo, when the bats have come out of hibernation, they will, they kind of shed signs that they've had white nose syndrome. So you can, again, do another one of these different lab analysis and see if there's signs of the fungus in the guano. You can do it with bat guano, and you can also analyze environmental samples. I mentioned that Montana has found it in the soil. So we've actually got a plan in Alberta to start doing that testing as well. I mean, BC has that little um, clump near Seattle where white nose is spreading out of. So it's even closer to BC. So it's a greater, more imminent threat to them, but um, Alberta is gonna be doing that as well. So that's a great point, John. And I know too that in BC, uh, volunteers do a lot of fantastic work, both the acoustic monitoring, like the guano collection, everything. And we do have some pretty good volunteers here too, but I know that BC has a particularly large bat network. Neat. That's awesome. Um, the next question is from John again. Um, does your group have others lead? Did your group or others lead public bat walks to educate citizens about these wonderful creatures? Absolutely. Obviously last year was different <laughs> because we couldn't have groups. The Alberta Community Bat Program has some coordinators in a few different places in Alberta, primarily Edmonton, Calgary, Lethbridge, and they members and volunteers do lead bat walks. Maybe, I don't know if people on the, this call have had any bat walks. So obviously you can do a bat talk like I did and show the pictures. It's great if it's summer and you can be outside and you know have a bat detector and you can be maybe near water where the bats, there's a lot of bat activity. You can see the bats and then you can see that screen if you remember I showed you that showed the bat calls. You can hear them and see them. And so that's one of the more popular activities um, that we do. And there are, you know, dozens, dozens of them that are done every year in Alberta. Obviously this year was different and it's been mostly this kind of conversation that, um, that we've been having, but hopefully next year we'll be able to, or this summer might be able to have smaller outside groups and can get back to doing those, those bat walks. Awesome, okay, now, from DA Moses, um, when is the best time to hang a bat house in Southern Alberta? Do you have more comments on bat houses? Is it a good idea? That's a, it's an excellent question. There's lots of parts to it. So um, first thing I'll say is we do have a really good guide that I, I think I showed you that picture of on the Alberta Community Bat Program website that can provide the details about bat house design placement. Um, we're still learning quite a bit about bat houses. A lot of the research initially came from the Southern US and obviously Alberta is different. And within Alberta, you've got the South where it can get really hot. And in fact, a bat house maybe could get too hot um, versus where I am, that's a little further North, that's probably not gonna happen. Our general advice was always to um, put the bat house, you know, paint it a dark color, make, put it up so it's facing the south so it gets warm. In some really hot locations, including in Alberta, that might be a bit too hot for the little pups inside. Um, so just there's a bit more information on the website. We could spend a lot more time talking about it. It's an excellent question. So, and bat houses, the best kind of bat houses are the multi-chamber ones. Again, those designs are there. So probably um, for, it's a four chamber. So the reason we have different chambers and it's bigger is again, depending on the temperature, the bats can move around inside. And so that's one of the things we're learning too. And um, there are vents in the side as well. So it doesn't get too hot. And um, there's a whole actually study going on across Canada. Um, there's a, a 
postdoctoral student who's who's asking people to put temperature and humidity sensors in in bat houses um, and there's other little research projects so we're doing some of that in Alberta as well so I would say that bat houses can be very useful um, and the best kind are the large maternity houses if you don't have bats right in the area or you're really far away from water you're probably not going to get uh, you know a bat colony coming in there um, personally, I have, I think most people are familiar with those little small single chamber ones. And those have been great for a workshop and especially groups and community groups like Boy Scouts, Girl Guides, building them. Um, they won't actually support a colony of bats, like a maternity colony, um, but bats will use them from time to time. I, mean, I live out um, in the forest essentially, and I've got mine on the edge of the forest and occasionally bats use them. So. Um, those male bats that get to be the swinging bachelors and they're not uh, having to stay in a warm maternity colony all the time. Um, they may use those small ones from time to time, but it's the big ones that are really important. And especially if someone has a building roof, a maternity colony, and they can't keep that colony, then there's a lot of considerations about when and how safely to exclude the bats and then providing them with a bat house is really important. And having that bat house there for when the bats come back in the spring is, is the best time. And it can take a year or two for bats to use them. And I just talked about swinging bachelors. So something I didn't mention is we don't know a lot about bat mating, but um, we think, well, most of the bats, um, when they get to these hibernation sites, they have swarms and they do a lot of their mating then and then they go their separate ways. So the male bats have nothing to do with raising. Yeah. <laughs> Good to know. Um, so again, John wants to just say great presentation and lots of facts. So, and yes, I agree. It was a great presentation. Um, Mike would like to know, what is the, the spatial resolution and range of the echolocation system? the bats echolocation system? Yeah. I don't know if I can answer that fully because it, different species of bats echolocate at different frequencies and also it depends on the habitat. So a bat that's in a, like in a forest, we call it a cluttered environment. There's lots of stuff around like trees. It's not gonna be, it's signals not gonna go as far Whereas the bigger bats that are above the tree canopy will be able to um, extend that echolocation farther. I don't know exactly how far it is. Um, yeah, you know, I don't know if anyone's asked me how far their echolocation is. Most people ask me about bat detectors, how far it can <laughs> pick up on a bat. Um, I would say in a general sense, it's uh, tens and dozens of meters. Um, they do usually need to be within, probably within a meter or two of something smaller, like the bigger, you know, bigger landscape features, they can probably be um, hundreds of meters away, I would, I would say. But again, it depends on the species, and the size and the habitat. Okay, awesome. Um, Janet asks, you've said that bats are vital in the ecosystem. What purpose does a vampire, do vampire bats serve? Not that they bother me. I just think they're fascinating. Yeah, you know, I don't know if anyone's asked me that either. <laughs> um, so vampire bats, I guess, they're blood eaters. Before people were really around in that part of the world, they would just be feeding on other wild species. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think there, how I can define what their role is. I mean, certainly it's easy for the insect eating bats because they're the primary consumer of nocturnal insects. So they keep that in balance. Um, I'm guessing maybe at some point in the very distant past, well before people had colonized, they may have had a role in helping to um, keep something in balance. I'm not sure. I mean, right <laughs> now, they totally live in an ecosystem that has people in it. 
Um, it's usually imbalanced unless there were way too many bats in an area. Um, you know, if a bat was constantly every night going after the same cow, that would be good. <laughs> but as long as it's in balance, um, it works out okay. So I don't, I'm not sure if I can answer, if I've answered that question very well. Probably the hardest bat species that I could think of to um, talk about, but obviously it evolved in that role for a reason. And it may be a little bit different now that people are on the scene, but there must have been, um, there must have been a reason at the time. And in fact, we think maybe that even they made that leap from blood from somehow eating insects or insects on other animals and then going into the blood. So there's probably a, a stronger link if you go farther back in their ecology as to the role that they initially played in that ecosystem. Hmm. I've never thought of that before. That was an interesting question. Um, so John has posted for anyone here listening in the comment section, he has provided some um, links to some, um, it says that for anyone interested in one of our local park associations created a video as a virtual bat walk and then there's the link and then he's provided a couple other links if you're interested in learning more about bats and taking your knowledge like further mm -hmm, um that's great. maybe copy and paste these links so yeah. you can look further um And the Shinnok Arch has also um, posted the link to the Alberta Community Bat Program website. Just That's let great. it there. And there is a pretty good social media presence from the Alberta Community Bat Program. So there's Facebook, Twitter, I think we've got Instagram, and even they're starting to develop some YouTube videos. So it's expanding. Cool. Yeah, I think this year, was probably the year that, if any year to do it, <laughs> this yeah. year would be the year to expand yeah. on YouTube and such, right? Okay, so John has another comment. In BC, we are now moving to Mount Bat Box. We are now moving to Mount Bat Boxes back to back to provide multiple microclimates and enable the bats to move depending on the temperatures. Right, so, and that's all part of what, you know, what we're trying to study in different places to see how much we need to consider bat place, bat box placement. And that's certainly a good one because, and there's also, if people ask about where to mount bat boxes, on the side of a building tends to be pretty successful. Um, otherwise on a pole, sometimes trees work, but the poles work. And then as John was saying, if you have a pole, then you could have bat boxes back to back. They could even be interconnected. So the bats can go in between. So if that south facing um, area is just too hot, they can move to the other side. There is one design of bat box called a rocket box. And it actually is built around um, a central pole and then it's got four sides around it and so the bats can move around. So that's one way of doing it or as, as John said having the other two style of bat houses more traditional bat houses back to back and it allows them to crawl around and move around. Oh neat. Cool. Mm -hmm. um, let's see I'm just trying to keep up with all these interesting comments. Um, John also mentioned that bat saliva is also used to treat stroke victims. That's really interesting. Yeah, and those vampire bats too, because of their, their saliva, because they have that little blood meal, they have anticoagulants in it. So the blood flows easily. And so that's also been used in, in medicine as well. In certain oh, practices. Yeah. Interesting. And Mike asks, how do groups of bats avoid audio clutter from other bats? 
Um, that's a very good question. <sighs> There's a couple of ways I guess I would answer that. One is they probably, in some cases, they're not that dense together. Um, and bats, that is a, an environment they're used to navigating in. So I think they just naturally are able to, just like we can hear lots of sounds around us and we're able to um, focus on some and not the others. And without getting into the details, echolocation is very sophisticated. Um, it's like they make a call and then they actually sort of close their ears temporarily so they're not, when they're making that call and hearing it come back. So I think it's just, um, I guess, the evolution of the echolocation calls that they're just like we can hear or see lots of things. They're able to um, distinguish that. Um, there are some moths that actually can have their own kind of sonar and they can jam the calls of the bats when the bats are coming in to confuse them oh, so they don't really? get a clear echo coming back. So that's a defense mechanism. That some of those moths Holy, have. I would have never known. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But I, I think, um, yeah, in terms of the echolocation too, they're also in an open area. It might be different if you thought of bats in a, an enclosed space, because then there'd also be bear calls. There'd be lots of bouncing <laughs> all around it. But if you've got, you know, a limited number of bats in, in an open area, um, that's also going to help prevent a big buildup, all that audio noise. And again, when there's really large groups of bats like that last picture I showed of the bats flying out of the cave, they might not even be echolocating then because they it's dusk and they can see pretty well. So, and there's still stuff we need to learn about that. Occasionally we get the impression that uh, a bat calling might attract another bat, but um, they also have social calls. They do make some audible squeaky noises and they make social calls that aren't echolocation calls as well. So there's, um, yeah, quite a bit, quite a bit to echolocation. I'm not an expert on echolocation either. Hmm. Good question. Another question from Mike. Can bats see into the ultraviolet or infrared wavelengths? Not that I know of. Um, in insect feeding bats, as far as I knew, they're pretty much in the black and white is what they see. Cool. Um, I have a question also. Um, do the different breeds of bats, will they fly together or do they generally just stick to themselves in their own little group? Hmm. For, well, in terms of roosting together, like maternity colonies, they tend to be one species staying together. In a hibernation site, you might get more than one species. And in terms of going out and flying and foraging at night, um, they might overlap. At, you know, and typically around anywhere in Alberta too, they aren't such large groups. They're not going out as a big group. I know you might see some congregations over water, um, areas where there's high concentrations of insects. And so you might get a couple of different species there. Uh, and again, it depends on the habitat. So the bigger bats, will be in more open habitats. The smaller bats can forage in the cluttered habitats like forests. So they just naturally will be in different habitats. But um, yeah, you'll definitely get some in different species in the same places. Because one of the, the way we catch bats is using mist nets. So birders do this as well. So it's like a, a big net, like a volleyball net, but it's very ultra fine. And because bats echolocation is so sophisticated, they can detect these nets. And so bat biologists have to figure out places to put these nets where the bats may not be fully paying attention <laughs> to where they're going or something like that. And, um, and then so we can put up these mist nets and we may catch multiple species of bats in the mist net within a very short period of time. So that shows us that they are, um, definitely foraging in the same area some species will. And, and there's been some evidence that some bats might cue in on other bats echolocation when they're feeding, maybe being successful at feeding. Cool. Um, John says that they have evidence of tree bats such as a long-eared myotis follow 
Little brown myotas to foraging areas when the LBMs leave the maternity colony, and different species of bats will try to rescue other bats when when missed netting bats. Yes. Yeah, it's really interesting that John says, as I said. You know, there's definitely some suggestion or maybe evidence that in some cases, bats will follow other bats. Um, I've caught a lot of bats in mist nets and it only seems occasionally, and I, you know, I'm not sure what the circumstances are that another bat might come in. When you have a bat calling, it does happen, definitely happens sometimes, but it's not common. So we don't fully understand that. Maybe that goes back to the social calls and, that's one thing we don't know a lot about yet with insect eating bats that probably plays a bigger role than we know is those social relations. So there's a lot more for us still to learn. Mm -hmm. um, this question is from Gail and she asks, what is the evidence that wind generators in Southwest Alberta cause bat mortality? Because they find lots of dead bats <laughs> below the wind turbines. Um, this has been really well researched. It started in the Eastern US, I think in Virginia. And then in the, I guess, you know, the wind farms really, they were only starting 20 years ago. And I think it was about 05 in Alberta, there was a large wind farm and there was a, a graduate, study that, graduate student that did a study there. Um, one of the ways and so we have found it's mostly the migratory species, at least in Alberta, um, and it's mostly late summer. So it's that fall south migration. It's not too bad when they're coming north. So that suggests to us they have different migration routes. We do know that the taller, you know, as, as they've, the technology has been progressing with these wind turbines are getting taller, that does seem to kill more bats. Um, one thing we do know is bats don't like to fly in higher winds. So if a wind turbine doesn't start operating and turning and generating um, electricity at a low wind, that's the same time the bats are out. So if the, the wind turbines aren't active at low winds, then the bats will be active and they're not going to collide. So it's um, part of it is just finding what that balance is. And the other thing that's really tricky is there's some evidence to suggest that bats are attracted to these wind turbines. Um, there's a couple of different theories. One is that I talked about these migratory bats. Normally they roost in trees. So especially if you're out in the prairies in an open area, you find these tall structures, maybe they're like trees. Um, there was a theory that maybe the insect abundance was greater there. I'm not sure if that's the case and possibly even mating. Again, we don't know a lot about it, but there's pretty strong evidence to suggest that at least some species are attracted to these tall structures. And it's in this windy corridor where they're passing through anyway at a similar height. So um, we, we kind of know what we need to do. Um, however, there's always that balance with economy because obviously the wind turbine companies need to make money. And um, it's great, it's the green energy, we want to support it but it's trying to find that balance. And um, birds, you know, birds do have issues with wind turbines too. Um, it depends a lot in the area in Alberta, more bats than birds are killed by wind turbines. Interesting. Um, we do have a fairly local author, Alberta author. And right now her name escapes me. Pamela McDowell, have you ever heard of her? She writes young adult novels and she's written, a, they're primarily about around Pincher Creek, like around Southern Alberta, this little corner of the province. And she's actually written a book about I think it's called The Trouble with Bats. And it's about a little girl 
finding dead bats under a wind turbine and deciding and finding out how she can help the bats. Okay. And how to, I think it's Bats in Trouble or something. Okay. It's a really cute book. So I had oh, heard about, okay. and in the book, it also um, um, describes a solution that she she comes up okay. with. So I I don't know if it has anything to do with that. Um, Probably that um, research student who did. Yeah, there's been that. a lot of research since then, and um, when farms um, they do have to monitor several times during the summer to see how many bats are being killed, and then depending on that, if it seems like it's too many, that's when they need to start mitigating by maybe um, making sure those turbines don't start to a, until a certain wind speed. Um, mm -hmm. The other kind of technology that's really just become available is acoustic deterrence. And it may seem like that was the obvious answer if you could just broadcast a deterrent that would um, keep the bats away. The problem is high frequency sounds attenuate or dissipate really quickly. So there's again been a lot of research about um, you know mounting speakers and whether it's on the nacelle or the actual blades and all sorts of things. Um, there is a company that has started to market them commercially, but it's still a pretty new um, new area. But so acoustic deterrents or those echolocation deterrents are um, are being used as well and being studied. And to anyone. Uh, listening in, if you check your comment box, um, Jane from Chinook Arch did insert the link to that no that novel that I did just mention. So if you want to, have to go have check to look it that out, up. yeah, you can. They're yeah. really cute books, and she's written I think four or five different okay. ones about ecological issues and they're really mm -hmm. fun to read. And the, I mean, the wind farm, the wind turbine is such a, a difficult issue because it's, it's green energy, it's good energy, it has some downsides. So we have to figure out how we can accommodate those so downsides. Much, you want yeah. so much to love it, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. right. Yeah. Um, another question is from Cindy, do bats typically carry rabies? And I think you answered this in the beginning, but if you want to reiterate. Yeah, um, bats can carry rabies as most mammals can. Um, it's a very low percentage, less than half of 1% in Alberta. So it's not something uh, that we need to worry about, just to be aware of it and don't pick up a bat if you find an injured bat because it might bite in self-defense and that's how the virus is transmitted is through their saliva um, getting into our bloodstream. So if you don't pick up a bat, <laughs> you have nothing to worry about. Awesome. Um, Mike asks, has anyone done any frequency domain analysis on bat echo, echo, echo location system? I'm not sure I understand the question <laughs> about the frequency domain. Um, there has been a considerable amount of research on echolocation, so I'm guessing yes. I don't know, Mike, if you want to add more detail to that. Or it might be beyond my familiarity with echolocation. Yeah. Okay. Um, any more questions, guys? That's the last one on the comments so far. Um, so, um, I guess, unless someone wants to quickly type a question, oh, here's one. Um, oh, okay. Marcy, we've heard that the bats do not actually collide with the turbine blades, but rather their chests are crushed by the differential pressure wave produced by the blade paths. Any truth? this? Yes, that is called barotrauma and it's because their lungs are so highly vascularized and uh, the pressure at the tips of the blades 
And I don't know, it was 10 or more years ago that um, they really felt that most of the bat deaths were caused by this barrow trauma. Um, since then, um, the research has gone back to support it's probably most likely collision or more often it's collision than barrow trauma. Interesting. I had never heard that. Um, Mike, if I think this is a follow up to his complicated question. Um, if it is a sharp click, this can be thought of as a, a sum of many increasing frequencies. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm totally getting I, the bats. They do echolocate in a range of frequencies and those clicks as they get closer and closer together they kind of run in and um, if we could hear it it would sound more like a buzz than a click. I don't know if that's the um, answer you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> but and there is yeah there's a quite a bit of, of range and again the the whole science of, behind echolocation is is quite involved. <laughs> 